Trigeminal neurology incidence is about four to 20 in 100,000. Two type. The type one is the best type. Most of the time, type one is associated also with the vascular compression. And uh, it's really when the patient has a significant amount of pain, that means that the patient has at times no pain whatsoever. And in the interval of a few seconds to minutes to hours, has an excruciating pain that goes so high that it's unbearable and then goes back to normal, completely normal, like nothing happened. And then for some time that that time frame could be minutes, could be hours, could be seconds. Another excruciating pain coming, going 10, 10 out of 10, 12 out of 10. Sometimes some of my patients say 20 out of 10. It's unmeasurable and it's really uh, atrocious. And that goes back to normal. So this is a type one. Type one that means that there is period of absolute no pain in between. Type two, the pain is never as excruciating as the type one is. However, there is a constant pain and there is a component of burning to it. Now, if you can see in um, the parentheses, I have put 28% without neurovascular compression. And on the second one, I have put 18% without neurovascular compression. Although trigeminal neurology is usually caused by and believed to be caused by vascular compression, there are cases, and these number, numbers are, in my opinion, a little bit exaggerated. I got these numbers from uh, some of my co colleagues' um, publications. Uh, in my personal experience, over hundreds of surgery for trigeminal neuralgia, I have not had 28% without neurovascular compression. I would question the indication for surgery for those patients because I think if the indication and the diagnosis is correct, there are very, very few situations where you do not find neurovascular compression because basically that's the cause that we are describing. So if you've done in 30%, you don't find it, then you could question this cause. What type of uh, etiology is that is not present in 30% 30, 30 of cases? So beside the type one and type two, we have trigeminal neurology that are associated with multiple sclerosis. 10% of patients with MS have trigeminal neuralgia, and 4% of patients with trigeminal neuralgia could have MS. That's something that has to be considered. Now, that does not necessarily mean that if someone has MS and trigeminal neuralgia, then automatically that person does not have a vascular compression. You can have a combination of both. But you also have to know that multiple sclerosis cause plaque in the brainstem, and those plaque can be at the level of the trigeminal nerve and cause trigeminal neuralgia. And treatment for that is different than the treatment that we propose for essential trigeminal neuralgia. We have to be aware also of the atypical facial pain, which is a deafferentation facial pain. This is a pain that is not characteristic of trigeminal neuralgia. Trigeminal neuralgia is usually a sharp pain Obviously, if it's a type one or type two, it's a little bit different, but what you need to know is that usually it's a sharp pain. It's in the branches of the uh, trigeminal nerve V1, V2, or V3. Vast majority of the time is unilateral. It's exacerbated by a um, uh, sort of like a zone that if you, for instance, touch the face that can elicit the pain, the cold weather, ice, chewing, sometimes talking, eating can uh, exacerbate the pain or actually start the pain. And that's why some patients do not eat. They can't eat because as soon as they start chewing, the pain starts and they become miserable. I have operated on some patients mainly because they were becoming cachectic because they couldn't eat anymore. And they were within 10 days, they were basically, they lost 20 kilograms or something like that. So uh, and a typical facial pain is not like that. A typical facial pain usually is a burning pain, is a annoying pain, is not really a dermatoma, dermatosal uh, distribution, is not necessarily defined by the branches of the trigeminal nerve, can go behind the ear, can go on the scalp, can pass the midline. The frequency is vague. It does not respond to neuroleptics necessarily, while the trigeminal neuralgia usually respond to neuroleptic. That means respond to Tegretol, respond to uh, Neurontan, et cetera. So 
that is uh, for you to be able to distinguish what is a trigeminal neurology compared to atypical facial pain. And I, I'm, you know, I have a lots of cool surgical videos, stuff like that, and I will show you that. But I think it's important as a medical student that you understand this first before looking at the uh, cool stuff, because this is the important part. This is the part that will lead to those beautiful surgeries and videos. If you may, may uh, sort of uh, miss this part and not able to select the right patient for surgery, you will not have an identifier cause for trigeminal neuralgia and you will not be able to succeed. And the last thing a neurosurgeon or myself as a vascular skull-based surgeon, the last thing I want to do is to operate on someone uh, who is suffering uh, dramatically from a trigeminal neuralgia and then I end up uh, after surgery and then come and say, hey, listen, we did the surgery, but I don't think it's going to help you. So this is really the last thing I want to have. So that's why I'm very selective in, uh, in finding the right patient for it. And that's why I'm going very um, in detail regarding the presentation, indication for treatment, and so on. There are different MRI types that you can do after uh, identification of the patient with um, trigeminal neuralgia. And on those MRI, the in sequences are written here, Fiesta, CIS, high resolution, thin cuts, T1. You can look for vascular compression and you can see an area of the um, uh, proximal part of the nerve that the vessel is sitting on and creating pulsation. And uh, that's where the cause is. And uh, we're going to get to the treatment of that. So one other thing that you have to look for any patient with trigeminal neuralgia, that's a systematic thing that I always look, is that when you are planning to treat, specifically if you're planning a surgical intervention for a patient with trigeminal neuralgia, you want to look at the MRI and make sure there is no abnormal T2 signal in the trigeminal nerve, in the pons, whether they have, whether they have multiple sclerosis or not. Because if there is for whatever inflammation or disease that has caused T2 signal changes on MRI, on trigeminal nerve. That means that the cause is most likely not a vascular compression, even if you see a vascular uh, structure close to the red, reddish Obersteiner zone, because it's rare to have a vascular compression and an intrinsic disease inside the trigeminal nerve. So look for abnormality in the trigeminal nerve and make sure you rule it out before moving forward with more aggressive treatment. If you <clears throat> look at the different series, you can see that there are some trigeminal neuralgia that are without vascular compression. As I told you, some series uh, stays up to 30%. And usually those without vascular compression happens in younger patients. I told you the uh, age of frequency uh, is 40 to 60. So if you have a 27 year old patient with trigeminal neuralgia, it's more likely that if someone operates on that patient, they cannot find a vascular compression because it's unusual, it's atypical, and it's um, probably one of those trigeminal neuralgia which will not respond as good as we would expect to a surgical treatment. Usually those with without vascular compression also have a shorter duration of symptoms. So this, uh, what has been the observation in those group of patients who were operated on and at surgery, the surgeon did not find convincing vascular cause. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the outcome, when uh, obviously we get to, when we do we do surgery? Because the first line treatment is medication. And medication could be Tegretol, could be Neurontan, Lyricon, the white Baclofen, you know, your type one medication or stage one, and then you can go to different type of medication. Usually when a patient comes to me with two or three different medication, uh, each above a thousand milligram a day, and they still not happy or have a poor quality of life, this is already an indication for surgery. But you want them to have responded at least temporarily to medication because that is a criteria of sort of, I would say, is almost a confirmatory criteria that your diagnosis is correct, that, that yes, this is an essential trigeminal neuralgia. What I'm describing to you is a textbook description of trigeminal neuralgia. The patient that you see in the office are not necessarily a textbook. And you will see throughout the medicine, you see, uh, you read something on your textbook, you might know all your medical, like Harrison textbook, Cecile, whatever by heart. But then you go and sit in the office, patients are not 
representation of textbook, not necessarily. So you have to make your judgment what is closer to what. So you will see in trigeminal neurology, they are all, there are variable and variety of presentations. So you have to make it up to see, does it make sense for this to be a trigeminal neurology or not? Now, once it is, you would like this to respond to medication. So a neurologist send me the patient. And if the patient tells me, oh, they got me on Neurontin, was perfect for two years, but now it's not responding well, I have to increase the dose and I'm getting drowsy and I'm gonna I fall asleep when I'm driving. That's a good sign. At least the diagnosis is correct. If someone's coming to me, like imagine a 25 year old, uh, uh woman come to me and says, well, listen, I have this trigeminal neuralgia, my dentist diagnosed it, and then they put me on Neurontan. Now I'm taking 2000 milligram. It doesn't help at all. That's a red flag. Age is not good, doesn't respond to medication. Even if the MRI shows that there is a vessel, I have to be very cautious before opening this lady's head to do the microvascular decompression for the trigeminal neuralgia or any other type of surgical treatment. Now, if we want to see what or who are the patients who respond better to treatment. Once you decide that, okay, medical treatment failed for this reason, reason A, reason B, reason C, uh, doesn't work for some reason, does not work anymore, the dose has to be increased and the patient is uh, exhibiting sign of side effects and or if uh, the patient just doesn't want to be on medication anymore. So well, I'm tired of this, I'm taking this medication for 10 years, is there any better treatment? Then we get to options for surgical treatment. Now, the prediction of outcome, obviously, if you have an obvious vascular compression and the more severe it is, the higher the chance of improvement, at least based on my experience. And if the compression isn't by an artery, it's much better than if it's by a vein. And if it's a type two pain, which means a patient who does not have that excruciating pain, but that constant pain, sometimes a burning sensation with it. And it's always an annoying pain between like a six to eight by 10. And in that particular patient, if there is no neurovascular conflict found at surgery, I think that's a predictor of unfortunately bad outcome. The same as very young age. Usually I'd rather not to operate on very young patient. I have operated, unfortunately, uh, most of them have done well, but that is usually a category of patients who have a higher risk of not having a good response to trigeminal neurology. So they have to be selected very uh, carefully. Once we get to the surgical treatment, we have several options. One option is a minimally invasive or less invasive option is a percutaneous procedures. And you can read by yourself the different... Uh, type of procedure that we have is a glycerol injection. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.